Hey, good morning and welcome. It's really great to see you. Come on in. Good morning and welcome to our service here in Greystones Presbyterian Church. You're very welcome for wherever in the world you are and particularly if you're a member of Greystones. Um, it's great that we're joining together to worship God. Just got a few announcements before we begin our service properly. I want to mention that this week we continue with our noontime reflections. Tomorrow, Terry Price will be speaking to us, 12 noon, on our YouTube channel. And then on Tuesday, I will be back on Facebook Live. Um, that's on Tuesday, so that happen each day. Also, just want to mention our giving. As I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, uh, we're not in church to give as we normally do. Many people do give by standing order, which is great. But if you're not one of those, let me just encourage you to keep putting your money in your envelopes or set it aside so whenever we do come back to have our service here, you can bring that with you. If you want any more details about giving or other ways to give, um, including by standing order, uh, all the details are on the church website, probably on the little tab saying finance. Have a look at that. I also want to say thank you to everyone who takes part in these services. Um, it just makes it very special, but particularly to Bobby Davison. Bobby gets all these video clips from all over the place, and he's the one that pieces them together and makes them look beautiful. So if there's any complaints about our services, Bobby's actually the one to go to. Bobby, thanks a million for your, your time, your generosity, and your skill. And finally, I'd just like to mention that five years ago today, on the 17th of May, which is our son's birthday, happy birthday, Thomas, and anybody else who's having a birthday today. But five years ago today was my first service in Greystones as the minister here. Isn't that amazing? Five years to the day. Five years ago was Sunday the 17th of May. Where have those five years gone? It's been a great journey. Um, so I think that concludes our announcements. We've got a few people who would just like to say hi to you. Over to them. Hi to everyone in our church family. We're down at the Badger Sets near our house. There's no activity at the moment, but we do know they'll be out this evening. Um, it's going to take a bit longer before we see you, but we do know we'll see you soon. We hope everyone in Greystones and beyond are keeping well and safe, and our thoughts and prayers are with you. Miss you. Miss you. Miss you. Hi, and family and all the fit, everybody in the church. I miss you all so much. And I'm so thrilled to get so many nice cards and letters. I was very, very touched. Can I join? You're doing a great job, Gary, doing this. It must be a lot of hard work getting it all put together. But knowing you, you'll do fine with it. Hello. It's very strange talking to you all like this, but uh, very nice to be doing it and we've been greatly blessed staying at home being provided for looked after and also now enjoying walks by the sea so over to terry and uh, thank you so much for uh, all the ministry gary and all that you were doing and indeed all the family the kids zone uh, and the people who are working behind the scenes to bring us these uh, calls, these videos every day. It's so much appreciated. And we just wish uh, God's blessing on everybody in the church. We really miss you and we're looking forward to the day <laughs> yeah, where we can see you all again. And uh, we pray that you will have a good day today and just keep going. God bless you. Amen. So thank you to uh, Eileen, lovely to see her, wasn't it? Thank you to um, the Bennett family, it's great to see them. And thank you to Terry and Pat. So, I'm going to read some words from Hebrews chapter 4 as we begin our service. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one 
who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And so we can approach God's throne with confidence, because we are the people of the risen King, we are sheep of his pasture. So let us worship God. We're going to use two songs. We're going to sing, Come People of the Risen King. Then we're going to sing, The Lord's My Shepherd. After that, we'll be led on our prayers of thanksgiving by the Cranman family, Josh, Harry, Alana, and their mom and dad, Dale and Susan. So thank you to them. Let us worship God.
and I will trust in you. looking after those who are sick. Thank you for the doctors, nurses, scientists and researchers who are working so hard to fight the coronavirus and make people better. Amen. 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 Dear God, thank you for our schools and our teachers who are working so hard for us at the moment. Help our parents with homeschooling and enable us to learn as much as we can. We hope to get back to school in September. Help our schools to prepare for this and give wisdom to people in power to organise this in a way that is safe for all. Amen. 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 Dear God, we pray for our political leaders and decision makers that you may give them the wisdom to make the important decisions in terms of protecting public health and also enabling our economy to reopen. There are many people offering advice to them just now. Give our leaders the calmness of mind to enable them to charter the best way forward. Amen. 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 Dear God, life has changed so much for us all. Support the families who are juggling so much working from home or on the front line, and homeschooling. We think of those people who have lost their jobs. We know you have a plan for us all. Help us to remain trusting in your plan and providing a prosperous future for us all. Amen. 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 Dear God, thank you for all, for all our families Please keep us all safe. I can't wait to hug my grandparents. Amen. Amen. The reading today is from Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Amen. So I want to say thank you to Karen for our reading and uh, we're continuing with our look at the Beatitudes this week. And appropriately for my fifth anniversary, um, we're doing the fifth Beatitude. So we have looked at four so far. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know that they have got nothing to bring. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And you can't cling to the cross if your hands are full. So we come, we've got nothing to give God. He's got everything to give us. So when we realize that we are spiritually poor, um, completely bankrupt, so we mourn, the second one, blessed are those who mourn. We mourn for our poverty. Mourning is a good thing. To grieve is a good thing. It brings us to a, a better place. It is a healthy process. And then after that, we thought about um, blessed are those, uh, blessed are the meek, for they won't inherit the earth. So we thought about meekness, which is not weakness, but it is strength under control. Do you remember that? And then last week we thought about, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We were thinking about our appetite for God, appetite for the kingdom. And it is good to hunger and thirst, to want more of God. He keeps filling us up, but we keep being hungry for him and pursuing him because there is so much, so big. God is just huge. So we hunger and thirst for him and for his righteousness. So today is the fifth beatitude. Um, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What is mercy? Mercy and grace, in a way, go together. We're familiar with the, the word grace, and it's used many, many, many times. Grace, one of the ways of thinking about it is where, where God gives us something that we don't deserve. So we don't deserve to have salvation. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We deserve nothing, but he gives us these things as a gift. So we're given something that we don't deserve, that's grace. Mercy is not being given something that we do deserve. Actually, we're so broken and messed up that we deserve punishment. But God doesn't want to do that. That is mercy. He doesn't want to give us what in fact we do deserve. Like a naughty child who deserves some kind of punishment, some kind of consequence. But when they don't receive that, that is mercy. One of the definitions that I read about is, it can be defined as kindness. It is kindness that makes you forgive someone. Usually someone that has, uh, someone that you have authority over. Kindness that makes you forgive someone, usually someone that you've got authority over. So why? Would we want to be merciful anyway? And it's quite simple, because that's what God's like. If we need, there's no other reason that we need. God is merciful, and because he is, we should be too. Now you remember, these Beatitudes, indeed the whole Sermon on the Mount, is directed at people who are committed to Jesus, people who are followers of him, people who are Christians. This isn't for those who are outside the kingdom at the moment, those who are not followers of Jesus. 
This is directed at those who say, I want to follow you, Lord. And mercy is one of those qualities that we have. When God says, be holy for I am holy, that's the only reason we need. And here we are being told to be merciful because that is a family trait. To be in God's family is you want to be like him. And mercy is one of those traits. Mercy is at the heart of who God is. When God revealed himself to Moses back in Mount Sinai, and Exodus chapter 34 says this, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The Lord, the Lord, the merciful and gracious God. This is who God is. Back in Genesis chapter 18, um, Abraham had an encounter with some angels. And during that encounter, they told him that Sarah, his wife, would have a son. She overheard that, of course, and thought this was nonsense. But they knew. But then they told him that they were going to head off to Sodom and Gomorrah because they heard that that place was very wicked and they were going to check it out. And this is what, it, listen to this little passage from Genesis 18. So the man turned from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within that city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in that city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. You probably know that Abraham then entered into negotiation with the Lord. He went from 50 to, If we can find 45 righteous people, would you spare the city for the sake of 45? And God says, yes, for the sake of 45, I will spare the whole place. Well, says Abraham, what about if there are 40 righteous people? Would you spare the city for the sake of 40 righteous people? And God said, yes, for the sake of 40 righteous people, I will spare the whole place. And it went from 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. And Abraham said, if there are 10 righteous people, in the city would you spare it and God said for the sake of the ten I will spare the whole place so what was going on there what did Abraham see Abraham himself was a merciful man but you know what he saw he saw the extent to which God would go to express his mercy for God doesn't want anyone Second Peter chapter 3 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Indeed, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish. Some people have a notion that God is judgmental, just looking for an excuse to wipe out anybody. But that is completely wrong. In fact, it could be no further from the truth. God is a merciful and gracious God who doesn't want anyone to perish. Back in Genesis chapter 6, we find the story of Noah, a very well-known story. But in Genesis 6, God starts a countdown of 120 years. 120 years in which he would allow people to come to their senses, to turn around and come back to him. They saw Noah building his boat, building his ark. They would have heard the words that he said. And God had started this countdown. And they had this opportunity to come back to him. Did God want those people made in his image to turn back to him? There is nothing he wanted more 
That would have given him great delight. He wanted them to turn from their evil ways and to turn to him. He grieved over the people. It's a bit like Jesus when he was coming into Jerusalem. Do you remember he looked over Jerusalem and he said, How often I have longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. Jesus wept over the city. He just longed for them to come to him, longed for them to come to his Father, but they would not come. At every turn, the Lord does everything in his power to turn the people back to him so that he can bless them. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bless over and over again. He wants to bless. In Isaiah chapter 5, God likens Israel to a vineyard, a vineyard that he's planted, a vineyard that he loves, a vineyard that he wants to produce really beautiful grapes, but over and over again it simply produces bad fruit. And this is what he says. God asks, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have not done for it? What more could I do? This is our God who was out of his way. What more could he do? He says, this is the Lord, the Lord, the merciful and gracious God, abounding in love and faithfulness and slow to anger. We come into the New Testament. In John chapter 13, leading up to the crucifixion, this is the night before Jesus died. The disciples and Jesus are in the upper room, as you know, and they celebrate the Passover. But three times, three times, Jesus flags up to Judas the fact that he knows what Judas is thinking, what Judas is planning. Three times. The first time is when Jesus quotes Psalm 41, verse 9, which says, Even my closest friend, whom I trusted, he who shares my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus knew what was in Judas's heart. Judas knew what his plans were. And he knew now that Jesus knew. Number two, flagging up number two is verse 21 of that. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. For the second time, Judas heard those words. Judas knew that Jesus knew what he was up to. And then the third time, Jesus dipped a piece of bread and gave it to Judas and said, what you are about to do, do quickly. At any stage, after any of those three incidents, at any stage, Judas could have said, the game's up. Jesus knows. What am I thinking of? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to abandon this mission. This is not the right thing to do. I will not do this. But each time he chose not to think that or not to do that. And even afterwards, Afterwards, if he had come to his senses, he could have come to God who is the merciful and gracious God and thrown himself in God's mercy and said, I was a fool, please forgive me. He could have been forgiven, but he chose not to do that. God does not override our freedom to choose, but he is the Lord the Lord, the merciful and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Many people have found his mercy. You remember Peter? Peter vehemently denied Jesus three times. And yet, he found in Jesus someone who was merciful. He was restored, forgiven. Paul, the Apostle Paul, Writing to Timothy says this in 1 Timothy, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example to those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Many, many people have found 
the Lord to be the merciful and gracious God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 calls Jesus a merciful and faithful high priest. Go back into the Old Testament to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. These very famous words of the prophet Micah. The people, of course, had their, their rituals and their sacrificial system. It was a way to aid them to come close to God and for God to come close to them. And yet, listen to the words of Micah. Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Moses had given them ten commandments. Micah pairs it down to three. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God because we, we serve a God who is merciful. One time when Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, the Pharisees cornered the disciples and they asked them, why Jesus, why their, their master, their rabbi, their teacher, why don't he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I love what Jesus said in response to this, because he heard what was going on, and he went to them, and he quoted Micah to them. And he said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go and learn what this means. You know, we can read the verses in the Bible, and that's the easy part. Or you can hear me quoting them to you, that's dead easy. But do we really know what they mean? Or even more challenging, do we apply them to our lives? Do we live it out to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God? Mercy is costly. I was reading about a guy recently who worked in a huge financial institution. One of the perks of the job was that credit for your own personal use was very easy to come by. It was easy to borrow money. And this young man, over a period of time, ran up a debt in excess of 100 million euro. That's quite a debt, isn't it? Crazy, 100 million euro, maybe more. Of course, it was eventually noticed by his boss, and his boss called him into his office. And his boss said to him, this is a huge debt. It's got to be paid. Because if it's not paid, you're going to go to prison for a very, very, very long time. The employee says, <sighs> he was completely stressed, and he said, look, I'm really, really sorry. Please give me time. I will pay it back. I guarantee I will pay it back. But his boss knew there is no way he would ever get his hands on that kind of money. There is no way he could ever pay it back. And his boss, amazingly, said to him, I'm going to write off your debt completely. You won't owe a penny. Of course, the employee was completely flabbergasted. He was totally relieved. Can you imagine the burden being taken off his shoulders? But it turned out that he was owed money by someone else on the firm. Some other employee owed him about 100 euro. It wasn't very much. But he was so intent on getting back his money that he attacked, he attacked his fellow employee. In fact, he attacked him so violently that he nearly killed him. And he said that he wanted every penny of the money paid back. And he was so angry that he started legal proceedings to have him imprisoned until the money was paid. Of course, the boss got to hear about it. He was fuming. He was mad. 
He couldn't believe that someone who had been forgiven so much could be so petty, so hard, so mean to someone else. Of course, this story that I've read is a story that we've heard today from Matthew chapter 18 about the unmerciful servant. Jesus told this story in response to a question from Peter, his disciple. Peter wanted to know how many times he needed to forgive someone. You know, you might forgive someone once, maybe even forgive them twice, forgive them three times, three strikes and you're out, it's not what we believe. So when he went to Jesus, he says, do I have to forgive my brother even up to seven times? He thought this was ultra generous, seven times. But Jesus showed him that it wasn't a matter of numbers. It wasn't a matter of rules and regulations. It was a matter of the heart. To have a disposition of being merciful to broken people. For we're all broken people. All of us. We're all needy people. You know, mercy feels so good to receive, but mercy is often so hard to give. Yet, for those who are followers of Jesus, it is a requirement. You know what he requires of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Of course, the great, greatest expression of mercy is the cross. The cross that stood at Calvary. The cross that Jesus went to for you and for me. God's greatest gift, God's greatest sacrifice, the greatest expression of mercy. It was costly for Jesus to show mercy and it will be costly for you but we have been given so much so how can we withhold mercy from another Jesus said to us we've got to pick up our cross and follow him those who are followers of Jesus must be merciful because he is merciful we who have received mercy must show mercy. So what does that look like in everyday life? Perhaps if we can look at people and see them as though we're looking at ourselves. How would I want myself to be treated? How would I want to be judged by another? How would I want to be helped if I was in financial difficulty? How would I want to be forgiven if I'd done something silly? To look at other people as though we look at ourselves. And isn't that exactly what Jesus said? For Moses gave the Ten Commandments, Micah brought it down to three, but Jesus brought it down to two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And wouldn't you want someone to be merciful to you? And God has been. So when we show mercy, we are blessed. For blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. May God be gracious to all of us, to help us to be like him. We're going to respond to this as we sing a song. We're going to sing the lovely hymn. Here is love, vast as the ocean. Then after that, we are going to be led in prayer by one of our elders, Geraldine Easter, as we have our intercessory prayer. And then after that, we're going to conclude our service as we sing the beautiful old hymn, Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, who was himself a slave trader, but he realized how wrong he was and how he had been shown grace by God and how it made him change his ways. So... That will be the conclusion of our service. 
Amazing Grace. Let us pray. Loving Lord and Heavenly Father, let us remember those countries in the world where the populations are vast and they are facing this pandemic, where medicines and equipment to deal with this virus are in short supply or non-existent. We pray, O oh Lord, for healthcare workers in these countries that are battling not just the virus, but also heat, drought and food shortages. May they be granted the courage and stamina to face each day dealing with a disease that is no respecter of race, creed or age. We also bring before you the governments of these countries as they struggle to combat people's fears and anxieties and put in place safety regulations for the good of their nations. Remember, O oh Lord, all global mission workers and we ask that they will be protected and know and feel your comfort around them and we would ask your blessing on them as they continue their witness for you in these difficult and challenging times. O oh Lord, as we enter the first phase tomorrow of easing restrictions in this country, we would ask that the nation be patient and follow guidelines in the continuation of the suppression of this virus as laid down by the government, so as to ensure that as the weeks go by, the country may begin to return to work in an orderly fashion. We continue to remember those who place themselves on the front line in hospitals, in the ambulance service, fire brigade, delivery personnel, shop workers and many more. Keep them safe and protected as they go about their daily lives, both caring for the sick, delivery of all the supplies we need and looking after our safety and security. Remember, O oh Lord, people who are by necessity separated from their families, and who are unable to be with relatives while they mourn loved ones or those who are seriously ill in hospital. Those who live on their own and have no one to talk to. Those who suffer with mental health problems and addictions. 
Draw close to them, O Lord, and give them comfort. We think of all the students, both in school and university, who have had their studies interrupted and exams cancelled. O oh Lord, we would ask that they would feel a sense of peace as they face an uncertain outcome to what the future holds for them. Many students will be assessed by teachers on the work they have already done, and we would ask for clarity and fairness in the grades that will be awarded in this way. Finally, O oh Lord, in these times of constant change and challenges each of us face, let us remember to fix our eyes on you and to know you are always there for us, no matter what the circumstances are or the situations we find ourselves in. Enable us to have faith in you and to grow in the knowledge and love of you as the days go by. We ask it all in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. us today. Uh, we're going to conclude by the words of the benediction. So please hear these words as we conclude our service. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, 
but now you have received mercy. Live as his people in this place, showing to others the mercy he has shown to you.